Um, so, hey, uh, my name is Matt McLaughlin. Um, I'm head of developer advocacy for Event Store. Um, the purpose of this webinar is to take you all through a, um, a bit of a preview of Event Store Cloud, show you a couple of things that you can do with it, and um, basically give you some guidance on how to get started should you, should you want to use it. Um, if there's any questions, um, just stick them in the chat. Um, I'll either answer them as we go or um, when we get to the end, um, go through them there, depending on whether it seems suitable or not. All right, so I'm now going to do the most difficult part of this presentation, which is figure out how to share the right screen. Can anybody see that? Somebody please tell me if they can see my screen. All good, great, cool. Okay, so this is Event Store Cloud. Um, this is a product we've been working on for uh, just over a year now, I think. Uh, we started around about uh, March, April last year. And basically it's our way of being able to provide um, an instance of Event Store DB to you guys, but without any uh, overhead of management um, or looking after it, we basically take that, care of that all for you. This is the main console. This is where you'll come to do most of your stuff. And to talk a little bit about the hierarchy of it, um, within Universal Cloud, you can have a number of organizations. And within a given organization, you can have a number of projects. And it's within those projects that you can actually go ahead and create your clusters. Um, just to go over a couple of the other bits and pieces, we also have access control. So this is all the things that you would expect to see. So being able to invite your other members of a team to the console via invitations. We also have groups and policies. So should you want to be able to control the access to who can see, create, delete, or update the given resources, then you can do so here. By default, we create uh, one for every single project that's created for the admins. But if you just come down here to the details, you can see here you have the various resources that we can access. And then at the bottom of the subjects is the actual groups that will belong to those policies. Um, we'll also, um, at a later date, be adding in integration with third party identity sources. So if you manage things via identity server or Duende, as it's now called, or um, Off Zero, then we'll be able to help you out with that as well. That's a coming feature. And finally, we've got some basic settings here. Uh, where we can limit uh, the people that can be invited to the uh, organization by a domain name. So you won't accidentally invite somebody from outside of your company. If we go into a given project, this is where the majority of the, the goods are. You can see on the left-hand side, we've got a number of options. We've got clusters, backups, events consoles, networks, peerings, jobs, integrations, and settings. The three ones that you need to care about or we care about most is the clusters, networks, and peering. Now, because of the way that Event Star DB works, or Event Star Cloud works rather, we don't expose a public IP address. That means that if you actually want to get access to an Event Star cluster, you first have to create a network within Event Star Cloud. You then have to peer that network to your own network within your given cloud provider, be that GCP. Azure or AWS, and then the two networks can speak to each other. At that point, you can go ahead and create a cluster and you'll be able to get access to it. So just to demonstrate how to do that, the first thing you'd want to do is create a new network. And as I say, um, we can host on AWS, Azure, or GCP. We'll pick AWS, give it a name, and then we'll give it a region. Now, AWS and GCP, we host in all of the regions that they provide. Azure, we are a little bit limited because they only supply uh, free redundancy regions, uh, free availability zones in certain regions. So we only host in those. But in the case of AWS, you could go ahead and you could pick EUS2. Then you have to provide it with a CIDR block. This needs to be large enough to accommodate the number of clusters you want to create, and then click the Create button. I will click cancel, however, as I already have one available to save time on provisioning. 
Um, once a network has been created, you then have to peer it. You can do this via the peering section. If we create a new peering, you would give the peering a name, select the network which you wish to peer, and then you have to provide it with some information from your own cloud provider. This differs slightly depending upon whether it's Azure AWS or GCP, but in the case of AWS, you have to give it the account ID, the VPC ID that you want to peer with, and the peer address space of that VPC. These can all be gotten from your AWS console. The account ID is up here, the VPC ID is here, and then the side of block is this um, IP range here. Once you go off and create that peering, it can take a moment. Um, it seems to be a little slow on AWS side. I think my process them as a batch. But eventually you will get a notification in your peering connections that will say peering requested. If you accept that, then the two networks can then speak to each other. Once you've got the network and the peering set up, that's pretty much a one-time job, depending upon how you've got your infrastructure set up. But you, shouldn't have, you should only have to do this once. Then you can go ahead and create a cluster. First, you click New Cluster, and we'll give it a name. We pick the provider, in case of this case, we want AWS. Then we're presented with a number of options. You can see first, we've got the server version, which at the moment we have 20.6 and 20.10. Now, a couple of years ago, we changed how we do our releases. Originally, it was just you know, version three, four, five. When it came to what should have been version six, we decided that it would be better to move on to a year and month um, versioning strategy. So that means we now release um, on in February, in June, and in October. So that would be the 21.2, 21.6, and 21.10. Uh, 21.6 should be out in a, in a couple of days, actually. Um, the dot ten release is going to be our LTS release. That means that we will um, we will support that for a period of two years. The other two are just really intended um, to provide features if you need them soon, or uh, to give you an idea of what's coming up in the next release. Once we pick the server version, we then go to choice around projections. Um, now, the projections within Event Store DB um, are a system that we have that allows you to read events from one stream and project them into another stream, allowing transformations and, uh, and joining of events to produce new events. Um, you can either have it off system or system in user projections. We have some by default. So if you only want nodes running, you just click the system projections only. If you want to be able to write and use your own, then you need to select the last box. We'll leave those off for now. Then we are provided with a number of options for VM size we want to use. Uh, we provide everything from an F1 up to an M128. We've grouped them according to usage. So the F1 really is only suitable for kind of testing or, you know, hello world, um, having a little bit of a play with it. Development, we recommend a C4 or an M8. And then uh, production, we've got everything from an M16 to an M128. And on the right, if you choose one, we kind of give an idea of what sort of load uh, it should be able to handle. Then we've got a choice between single and free node multi-zone. Event Store can run as a single node or it can run as a, a free node cluster or even a five node cluster. Um, so if you, the, the purpose of which is for redundancy. So uh, if you want any kind of redundancy, you need to start with a free node cluster. We may be adding a five node cluster later. And we also have a functional node called a read-only replica, which we might be adding as an option later, which is our way of allowing you to scale out reads. Then you can pick your storage size. Um, it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what you choose at this point. Um, you know, you can, you can pick, uh, effectively, once the cluster is up and running, you can resize the disks that it saves to. So it doesn't matter in, in that regard. But also, if any of you have used um, uh, AWS GCP or Azure before, you'll know that the disk size often limits the IOPS as well. So we've given some indication around here as to which sort of size disks you should be picking. We'll leave it as eight for now. And then we pick the network we want to host it on. 
and then we can just go ahead and click create and that will go off and create a new cluster and that's it once that's up and running i'll show you a few more options um but at this point i'll probably talk a little bit about how um you can actually connect to the cluster from your local machine so as i said because we don't expose a public ip address um you need to connect to it via your own network. And that leaves you with two options. The first is to create a small uh, VM within your own network, to use it as a jump box that you could then connect to, and that will have access to the um, to VPC, uh, to events of VPC, or you can make use of a VPN tool. We recommend something called TailScale, and we give instructions within the documentation on how to set this up. But once this is, Basically, all that happens is you create a small VM within your network, you run this VPN software on it, you connect to that box via VPN, and then you can talk to a network. So if you're wanting to dev against the cloud, this would be a way to do it. If you don't, we still have a Docker images, so you can use those locally too. Once a cluster is created, there's a couple of things to talk about. The first is backups. So we now have the option to we have to create a backup. We have these tags. So if you want to suffix or prefix it with a bit of information like the date it was taken, you can do so. I mean, you can either create a one-off backup or you can schedule a backup to run every day and at a given time. And also keep only keep 10 backups before pruning. But I'll create a schedule and then that will backup accordingly, according to your, your schedule. Um, we also have the ability to resize disks, as I mentioned. So you just come in here, just give it a new disk size, and we will do an online resize of the disk. We will be adding functionality to be able to scale up and down the VMs. Uh, we're looking towards the end of this year for that. Um, we will also be adding the ability to upgrade the uh, version of events or DB that is running on your cluster as well. And when that happens, we'll notify you of a new version and it will be, again, a case of just clicking a button to upgrade it. And we will do an online upgrade of the event cell cluster as well. So we're kind of taking all of that management out of your hands. A um, couple of other things to mention as well. Oh yeah, that's one. With the backups, um, you have the ability to restore it to uh, the cluster in which it came from. Or if you want to restore it to a new cluster, you can just change the name of it, choose some new options, and then that will create a new cluster with that backup in place. We also have an events console, so no issues at the moment, but should you have any issues such as um, high CPU usage or you're running low on memory, then we'll give you a notification here. We also have integrations with um, third parties, so we can push any issues out to Slack, Ops Genie, or PagerDuty, our notifications. Metrics and logs will be coming soon. Um, they will allow you to push out to things like Prometheus and Datadog and all of the main um, metrics providers. But yeah, if you want to, uh, if you want to get woken up at uh, two o'clock in the morning to be told that you're running low on CPU, then we can definitely help you out with that too. Um, and what else is it to talk about? That's about it. So there are other options. Um, obviously the CLI is all nice and pretty, but if you're going to be using this in production, then you're probably going to want to make use of something like Terraform, um, which we have a provider for. Also, we have a CLI. So I'll show that now. Which is called ESC, which you can get from our um, uh, GitHub repository. And this will allow you to do all the things that you can do in the console, such as listing out all the organizations or having them in JSON if you will need them in a more passable format, as well as creating, if I can find one, there you go, creating clusters. So that's not all the information here, but you can create a, a cluster and providing all the information you would do, uh, that's a network rather, creating all the, a network, giving it all the information you would do in the actual um, web UI as well. 
And that's about it, really. Um, yeah, uh, if you want to get started with this, you can create an account by going to the uh, cloud, uh, console.eventstore.cloud. You'll be asked to register an account, and then once you're actually in uh, the console itself, you will be able to request for provisioning to be turned on, and then we'll help you get that sorted so you can actually start creating and using clusters. Um, I will show one other small thing as well, actually. We just go back to this, which is the actual cluster information. So once a cluster has been created, all the various addresses that you need to be able to connect to the UI, to the gRPC endpoint, or the TC endpoint are all available under the addresses tab. So you can just go to the UI, and there you go, as you'd expect to see. Any questions? There is one in Q&A. Any timeline for support for Docker support on M1 Max? Not at this moment, no. Um, you probably see I'm running on a Mac myself, um, but not an M1. Um, it's something we need to look into, but we don't have a timeline for it just yet, but I will take note of it. On that note, uh, when it comes to... Um, to actually getting started with Event Store. Um, we do have a Docker image that you can pull down off a, a Docker registry um, that will work on OS X Linux and um, Windows, but not M1 Max yet. Okay, well, I'll, I'll hang around for a few minutes if anybody has any questions. But otherwise, not, thank you for watching. <laughs>